This is the uh, time where we, 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 we're talking about the public square, and you know we've been doing this since 2005. I've had interesting conversations with people who have not been to one of these, and then we've had people who have been here uh, almost to the point we could give them insurance they qualified, um, which has been pretty good. But it was, a, it was an interesting experiment done um, primarily to open the doors uh, of our news, news gathering operation to people's voices on issues of importance. So um, we've, we've had 50, theoretically, somebody has reminded we've had 54 with this one, but we're going to stay at 50. And um, we, when we started them uh, almost 10 years ago, we did not know how long it would go. And, um, but news happens, important issues happen, and uh, this community is interested in getting together. I, I, I think what's one of the um, secrets of Richmond is it is a place where you can have civil conversation and we are very fortunate and humble to be that host. Um, we're going to do a couple of things. This is where we want to, we prepared a, a video uh, that kind of take you through the history. And then I'm going to get my colleague, uh, John Sarve, to take over from here. He's the, he's the master facilitator. And we've got a group of correspondents of the day to kind of tee up. If they had their druthers, what would be the next 50? Uh, we have a special guest. Some, uh, I'm going to call him a futurist because he uh, spends a lot of time helping businesses and communities figure out the future. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to have a kind of an intimate conversation about what should be the public square going forward. So without further ado, um, I, I will do make one mention. Uh, we have always a chair uh, reserved for Miss Ruby Turner, and that's Miss Ruby over here. And she's a star in this sh uh, program, and as, far as, as long as the public square goes on, there will always be a soft spot for our heart for Miss Ruby because she personified what it, what it means to be a, a, an interested person of a community um, who was tough as nails on issues but, but respectfully and civil uh, in, the, in the exchange back and forth. So without further ado, let's, let's hit it and take a look at the video, which reprises previous public squares and topics. Offered to, uh, if, you wanted, if you were in the uh, format of writing a letter to, to your congressman or woman, um, you can read portions of it here. Another thing that we're going to do is, uh, given the uh, intense interest, that we're going to send copies of tonight's program uh, in DVD form to, to, to our two Virginia senators and the delegation from Central Virginia so they also hear it. In addition, there will be a story in tomorrow's Times Dispatch. And as usual, we'll uh, put an edited transcript of tonight's comments in the Sunday commentary. I've been very upset ever since I heard that some of the senior Medicare benefits could be taken away. And all my life I've been blessed with good health until about the last year. I go to a great doctor who's very thorough. He sends me for the test I need and could have saved my life in the last year by sending me having the proper test to discover what's wrong. And I do not want this change and have a government committee say, well, we're going to take and cut this test out, and we're going to cut that test out. Life is precious, and I do not want this change for anyone. One of the things I, I wanted to emphasize is you know, the, the governor is excited about this proposal, and he's excited about tonight because he wanted to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you on his behalf. Um, he's um, had a very successful year um, moving forward on his jobs and opportunity agenda, and that's really what um, this ABC privatization initiative is, is about. I believe my responsibility as a legislator is to ensure that the Commonwealth is managed in a fiscally responsible manner and to protect the interests of the citizens and the taxpayers. After carefully reviewing the governor's plan unveiled on September 8th, I do not support the selling of our most prof one of our most profitable assets, our ABC stores. I first introduced a piece of legislation, I believe it was in 1983 or 1984, to privatize parts of the ABC system. It was ironic because at the same time, then brand new Governor Chuck Robb had the same ideas. His didn't go quite as far as mine. But there's been a lot written about all the money that's involved in privatizing ABC in Virginia. That's a serious issue, but my concern is, is not as much about the money as it is about the uh, social impact uh, that uh, privatization is going to have. Right now, under our present control system, on an average, Virginians consume about 21% less hard liquor than the national consumption rate.
Virginia's ethics laws operate under two tenets. The first is that politicians ought to decide for themselves what gifts are appropriate to accept from lobbyists and favor seekers, so the law is virtually silent on gifts. The second tenet is that any gifts that are accepted should be publicly disclosed. In theory, full disclosure allows the public to decide for itself whether a politician is on the take. But the problem is that the disclosure laws politicians have written for themselves are so full of loopholes that the public can't possibly know what gifts a politician has taken or what financial interest a politician has. So I think there are a couple of things that you can expect, or at least I hope. Um, I have said this to both my uh, Democratic colleagues on both, in both chambers, as well as my uh, Republican friends in both chambers. And so what I, what I hope we will see is a bipartisan bill. I think the last thing that Virginians want is to see us uh, throwing sticks and stones about what ethics reform should look like. Uh, Matt footed tonight on the talking, but just for a minute, I, I think we ought to rise above and the, the weeds we're down in and see the bigger picture just for a second, and then let's get down in the weeds. The bigger picture is we have a lot to be thankful for living in Virginia. Uh, Virginia is the best man state the best state to do business in, fourth best state to raise a child in by Teachers Union Magazine, Education Week. We have the finest system of public higher education, on and on and on. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for in Virginia. Uh, and we give you that value for the 48th lowest price in the country. State and local taxation as a percentage of the average Virginian's revenue is 48. So that's a lot to be thankful for. Now, are we perfect? Absolutely not. And I think that's what Donald and I do every day is we try to address those things where we're not perfect. The marketing department gave me this to put on, so I'll try it, see how it goes. Uh, to me, it looks like the cat in the hat, but I, it's supposed to put me in a different type of a mood, and I don't, I don't know, although uh, the extras will tell you about the fine art of makeup and hat hair that would take you back to the 1800s. I'll wear this for a little bit, I'm gonna throw it away, but anyway. That, I think, is huge, and that's a really good indication of what this was for Richmond. This thing went viral in Richmond in the afternoon. One local guy took it at Arcadia Restaurant in Chaco Bottom. He tweeted it, and for the record, if Daniel Day-Lewis comes back, had he not tweeted it, he probably would have gotten somewhere in the neighborhood of $25,000 for the picture, is what I've heard. I was a high school teacher in Winter Park, Florida. And it was a break, it was lunchtime, it was around lunchtime. And I stepped outside my office. In Florida, of course, we have uh, short buildings because of the sinkholes. And so I had an outside door to my office. I just stepped out for some fresh air. And a number of female students came by weeping. And I, I didn't know, I couldn't figure out why the, why the huge number of girls were weeping. And so I ran across the sidewalk to the, to the business, to the business office of the school. I said, what, something happened? They said, Kennedy's been shot. And we called for the school buses, closed the school, and everybody went home laughing. My name is Ruby Turner, and concerning charter schools, I oppose them. It's like help some but forget the others. Uncle Sam, used to have on some of his uh, stationery, if the student fails to learn, it's because the teacher fails to teach. And to me, charter schools is a dressed up way of resegregation. If you have a child, have a student who is slow to learn, then more energy should be spent on helping that child to learn and overcome. I listen to our kids coming out of high school God help those in college, and they cannot even construct a correct grammatical sentence, let alone a paragraph. What are they learning? What are the teachers? You have teachers that can't talk. I say get rid of them and bring in some teachers who are capable to teach so that they can attract our children's attention to be willing to learn. Thank you. But I remember the words that I saw on this a uh, fowl sitting on the oak, and his words were, the wise old owl sat on an oak.
the more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we be like this old bird? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Well, well. Okay. Now, why don't you stand up? It's, it's Miss, I have on good sources, it's Miss Ruby's birthday today. So, look, I'm going to ask the Public Square team here, team, Public Square Nation here, to sing happy birthday to Miss Ruby. Ready? One, and please help me out because I'll break the microphones. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Ruby. I don't even know your name. Happy birthday to you. All right, Eric Kay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Robin does. Uh, my wife is a school teacher. She's taught school since uh, 1967. And she tries, still tries to teach me things, <laughs> which is hard to do. And we have two children and four grandkids. And I love the Time Dispatch. It's a good paper. It's improved a lot, um, particularly since uh, Time has become publisher of it. And also, I suppose, since Warren Buffett uh, has a stake in it, too. He doesn't hurt, does he? So anyhow, and Lee, when you before you pass the mic, when you think uh, forward over the next five years, what what are one or two topics or issues that are really dear to your heart that you think the region should be talking about? Well, we need. I would say we need to still attract uh, a large corporation, but particularly encourage entrepreneurship. As as Tom knows, I wrote a book two years ago on entrepreneurs, and uh, it consisted of fifteen entrepreneurs. Uh, all of whom, fourteen were from Virginia, one from Maryland. And uh, we have some good people around here. We need to encourage more capital formation. It's very important. And uh, it's hard. To go into business is very difficult because the odds are that about two-thirds of them will not make it past the, uh, the fifth, fifth year. But we still need to encourage it because we hire workers by that way. We get ideas and we help grow the economy. So I would just say that people should, uh, should uh, put a focus on more capital formation. Great. Thank you, sir. We'll pass the mic. Sorry about that. Um, my name is J.C. Fuller. I attend Cosby High School. Ms. Soraya down on the end is my government teacher and my classmates as well. Um, I'm on the debate team uh, with Chase. We get a lot of arguments and stuff. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to attend Wake Forest University, study political science, minor in journalism. Um, oh. Uh, I wrote a editorial in the paper uh, against the Chesterfield County proposal for Chromebooks in the classroom. Um, I believe that it's you know it's not the only way that you can teach kids. I think that you know teachers teach kids, not computers. Um, but you know the thing that I want to mainly focus or that I want to bring up for the next five years in Richmond is just fiscal responsibility. You know we we all want nice things. We all want the government to provide us services, but then we complain when we're in debt. You know, we spend beyond our means. An example is Chesterfield County. They're in debt already. You know, the Chesterfield County Public Schools, that is. Um, they're in debt already, but they're taking out loans to, you know, provide these computers. We all want nice things. We, you know, students might want computers, but it's not the fiscally responsible thing. Um, another example, they're, they're improving the schools, or they're improving the layout of the schools. And obviously, you want environment conducive to learning, but you can provide an environment conducive to learning without spending extra money that you don't have. And so I think that that's something that, you, that we really need to focus on is just not spending beyond our means and, and recognizing having, having realistic expectations of our government at the national, state, and local levels that they can't provide everything even if we want them to. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Chase Ginther, also a fellow student here of JC. Um, I wrote an article back in October, letter to the editor that was chosen, correspondent of the day. Um, it was kind of geared towards the 2014 midterm elections. That's kind of like, that's what I enjoy. I kind of enjoy the political strategy standpoint um, and looking at what, and looking at elections in the future. Um, but one issue I do hold near and dear to my heart, I guess, would be education. I've, you know, been blessed to attend um, really great schools throughout my life, and uh, I will continue to next year. I'm going to Virginia Tech, go Hokies. 
So, um, but I think one thing that we definitely need to look look at in the next several years is looking at um, the cost of higher education. As Lee said, you know, one thing that is very important to Virginia is entrepreneurship. And uh, when you're taking on a hundred, you know, looking at six figures of student loan debt, it's hard to create business in the world. And I think that's definitely something that we all need to take a look at because when you have some of your youngest and brightest people, they, you know, when you're paying 500 bucks a month in student loans, you're not able to take the risks and start your own business and go out and really fuel our economy. So that's definitely one issue that we should definitely be looking at. Great. And Al, I'm surprised you're still at Cosby. I <laughs> no, Al, right here, right next to you. You're, you're still a student at Cosby? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I was joking about you. He said these were all students at Cosby. Oh, okay. And oh, okay. <laughs> got the sweater, though. Right. Occasionally, my jokes fail. Right. So, uh, oh, well, no, there we go. Al Shallow, a student of Cosby. <laughs> I'm funnier when he says it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> uh, I'm from Midlothian, Virginia. Uh, they have, when they occasionally run out of things to print, uh, printed some of my letters and an occasional uh, two-cent uh, column, which I appreciate. And and also I thank uh, the uh, staff and Robin and and uh, some of the other ones for helping to edit some of my things. Sometimes I lose my train of thought. Uh, but uh, anyway, I've been a pharmacist for about 50 years, so I feel like one of the subjects that uh, I talk about is medicine and and how it affects people. Uh, some of you have probably uh, I have filled your prescriptions over the years or maybe even talked to you over the telephone. But I came prepared. I, I was too poor to be a Boy Scout when I was a kid, uh, but I usually come prepared for things. So I had written down uh, uh, eight or ten uh, topics that I uh, particularly would like to see in the forums, and, and I'll just briefly uh, go over those. Uh, first of all, I think it's a great thing to have the panel discussions. It's always a good icebreaker to, to have people up here to get uh, started on things. Uh, the, the first thing that I have, the mechanics of how Virginia, the Virginia General Assembly handles our money, uh, the balances, pay-as-you-go, borrowing, bonds, taxes, appropriations, that kind of thing. I know you can go on to the website and find all of this, but I think it's of great public interest to know how our money is being handled uh, and uh, have the people in the General Assembly accountable for that. And, and a follow-up to that could be Politics 101, a crash course in state government uh, for the young people to, to know how the government works and, and uh, I know they get it in schools, and I'm sure these guys uh, have, have done plenty in, in that regard. Um, can, can I just interject? We've had a number of government, we've noticed over the first 50 that fewer people are start, fewer people are showing up when the topic is government. The public square on gift gate and disclosure was had, had this ironic twist of being one of our smallest public square but everybody spoke, and if you read what they had to say, it was one of our best public squares. But we've noticed, and we actually, there's a picture of uh, Senator McEachin and uh, Delegate Massey, and we asked them why they were, and they, were, they actually came to sit in the back and listen. And we pulled them to the front because we had two major legislators from each side of the aisle and they were headed into a General Assembly session where this was going to be discussed. And we asked them. And both of them gave some really interesting uh, analysis in the fact that people didn't really feel it was worth their time to show up at yet another meeting to talk about government because they didn't think it would lead to anything. Um, and that was... Do you think people were just disillusioned that they weren't going to get the answers that they... I don't know. It, but... Um, it, is, it is by far um, some of the most crankiest public squares. People tend to come in and kind of, uh, you know, want to hold the microphone for eight hours and tell you why government is all screwed up. Um, it's, not not, it's not a very good back and forth, but um, we shouldn't give up on it. But all I'm saying is from the, from the 50 square, we've noticed 
a depletion of people showing up, and, if, and, and they also acknowledge a general fatigue on whether their comments contribute to anything that changes it. So you got frustration, fatigue, lack of confidence, um, and then, and, but at this other spectrum, high concern, fear, and um, worry that the process may be bogging down. So maybe maybe the format could be tweaked to to. Uh, maybe it is a format that. thing. Is is a good point. Now let's hear uh, let's hear two more, and then we'll go to your other Cosby peers here. And okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, real fast, could Virginia, like Texas and Florida, function without imposing state taxes? Um, third one is, give me five. Each participant can give up to, f to five brief one-sentence questions or statements on any subject with no direct rebuttal, but then an op open mic uh, invited later. The five W's of charitable giving, who, what, when, where, why, and how much, um, why we should keep our military strong. Uh, Robin always does such a great job with the military and why we honor our veterans, and I think we ought to keep that in the forefront of uh, what we discuss. The mental health problems, which was just discussed, I think is very important. Uh, and Dr. McCulloch, that just had an article in the paper, uh, indicated that we should add community prevention strategy strategy to repair the Virginia system. Uh, legal and illegal drugs, helpful and harmful, what they do to society and what we ought to do about them. And as a pharmacist, I, I know a lot about that. I know what people take. I know what trouble they get into with drugs. And uh, it is a, uh, a problem that we need to address constantly. And here's one for Tom Silvestri. This is the last one. Is it time to rename the Richmond Times Dispatch the Regional Times Dispatch? Hi. I'm <laughs> Megan Davis, and I go to Cosby High School, and Ms. Soraya is my teacher. Um, I'm planning on attending William and Mary next year, and um, this past fall I interned on the McAuliffe campaign. Uh, I wrote an article opposite of JC about why Chesterfield County should adopt Chromebooks in their classroom because I believe that technology is imperative to the future of our education, that it is a, not necessarily going to take over teaching, but it's going to be a tool in which teachers can utilize and stu students can as well. And in the future, I would really love to see um, topics such as education because I feel like our education needs to be focused on. and. It's an investment that we need to make in order for students to be given opportunity as I've been, I feel I've been fortunate in that I've been given that education's never been an option, but we can't make education an option for other students in this area. Hi, I'm Renee Sorreo. Um, I teach AP government at Cosby. Um, I've rarely been more proud than I am right now to hear these kids talk about the things I think are important. Um, I write a lot of letters to the editor, but more importantly, I try to get the kids to write them um, because I, I think it's great for them to expand in a civil way on their ideas. You think kids are disengaged, but you know, I watch them tweet about the State of the Union. I watch them in real time have amazing but very short discussions online about politics, and I'm trying to channel that into a, a longer and more coherent format. So I love it when they write letters and columns, and the Times-Dispatch has been incredibly generous in publishing uh, the kids' work, and I'm uh, eternally grateful to them. Um, I would love to try to figure out a way to get more kids to come to the public forums and to, um, I, you know, I don't even know, to reach out to teachers and encourage them to provide it as an extra credit assignment or something where the kids could come and and weigh in and listen and be a part of it. Um, I, I feel like I shouldn't suggest any more government-oriented ones after what Mr. Silvestri said, <laughs> but, but my th I had a, a thought again about the General Assembly. Um, it's, it's hard to teach about the General Assembly because there are no textbooks and you have to create it out of the newspaper and again I depend on the Times-Dispatch, but 
come. I would love something every December where you bring in a few legislators and they can talk about these are the hot topics um, for the upcoming session. Um, and you would probably be able to get them in December because they're not in session yet. That would be great, you know, just for, I think, um, knowledge. And I don't know if there's people would be interested in doing um, lo local or regional ones. I know in Chesterfield County we argue all the time, how are we going to fund the schools? What should our taxes look like? I don't know whether people would be interested in doing that across the counties or within a county. Um, I don't know, and I'm sorry to suggest other government ones, but I know that we argue a lot about that in our county, and I wonder if you know people might be interested um, about local issues as well. Great, thank you. So uh, we've already got a list of 50. Um, John Martin, you spent a lot of time wrestling with sort of big conceptual issues and getting way down in the weeds around things that are going to impact our lives uh, in this region. What are what are three or five or seven things that are sort of top of mind for you that you haven't heard yet? Well, that's a great question. And uh, first off, I'm so delighted you guys came. And uh, if y'all looking for jobs, I, and you in particular, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> One of the things that um, we study, I have a marketing research firm called the Southeastern Institute of Research, and we do a lot of um, review of demographic data and cultural data and try to understand what's coming next. And so the, the data that I really believe in is the census data when it, you talk about demographic trends. Uh, demography is destiny. And so a really big thing for us to deal with is our population increase. That we are about 1.2 million folks as a region and we're going to go to 1.6 million. So where, where are all these people going to live? You know, they're estimating we need like 5,000 new houses a year in Richmond. Uh, you know, over the next 20 years for all these people. And you're talking about 300, 400,000 more folks, and they're going to all come with cars. And so if we want to maintain our non-rush hour uh, any, any way that it's like today, if we want to maintain that, we've got to move to more balanced transportation systems. So that's one huge thing. And, and I don't think anything's going to reverse this population trend because America's growing, and it's growing on each coast. And this big, big, great crescent's filling in from Baltimore to Washington to Richmond over to Hampton Road. So we're going to have it, and we just got to be smart about it and uh, start thinking about better uh, design of communities and better ordinances and, and getting into more of a um, peaceful coexistence with their cars. So that's number one. I think number two, which is a really kind of um, interesting trend, is the age shift. And the age shift is happening because we've had a change in birth rate, and we're only replacing ourselves now. But at one point, we had this huge boom, the baby boom. And so all of us baby boomers, the largest uh, age cohort, going through society being so large, 78 million folks, as they go through society and they've gone through, and now the youngest boomer is 50 years old, right? So what is going to happen is we're going to have the doubling of the senior population over the next 20 years. And so we're going <clears> to <throat> go from about 10, 11% of our population being 65 plus to about 20%. And that has incredible ramifications for every community in the country uh, in general. And in particular, it's going to have some big ramifications for us. You know, think about when you get chronic diseases. It's mostly when you're 65 plus. So we're going to have twice as many people with uh, congestive heart failure and diabetes and, you know, I can go on and on and on. So how are we going to take care of all these people? At the other end of the spectrum, when you talk about this age shift, you're going to have a relatively smaller number of young people in their society. So we're going to have 20% over 65. 20% of our population will be over 65, and 20% is going to be 18 and younger. Never before since the dawn of man have we had that arrangement. It's usually a whole lot of young people, right? And then just a few at the very top. And that's the population pyramid. Well, that population pyramid is going to look more like a rectangle. And so what does this mean? Well, we're going to have debates about do we build senior centers or new elementary schools, right? And maybe the answer is we build both, but we need to, be start, we need to talk about that. Um, the other big thing about the age shift is that experts are projecting out into the future that we're going to have a shortage of workers. It's hard to believe to say that sort of at the tail end of this great recession, but we're not going to have as many of the folks in those younger age brackets relative to the population 
And so out in the future, experts are predicting there's going to be a battle for millennials, for our youngest age cohort, trying to get them to come to a city over another city. And a lot of the millennials in our research says that they pick their location first and then look for a job. And so if that's the case, we're seeing cities like Austin and Denver and Portland really get a jump start on being a hotbed for young people. And when you go there, you start to realize what they have to offer. So we've got to do more and more thinking in terms of how we're making our place here attractive to young people. Because it's not just that we want to keep them here, we want to keep our roaring economy going here. We're going to need them in the future even more than we do today. So uh, John, I could go on and on. How, do you want me to stop well, give here? Us one, give us one more. All right. Give us a, something cool. I'm going to give you something cool. All right. <laughs> so I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing a few folks my age. It used to be in Virginia and across the country, when you go onto a college campus 20 years ago, you would mostly see males, right? It was, you know, usually 60, 65 percent men, 35 percent women 20 years ago. When you go on a college campus today, it's exactly the opposite. It's at least 60 percent female graduating from college. Unbelievable. 60 percent, 40 percent is the split. And I have, uh, you know, some schools try to hide it, but they are that, that number is uh, a little bit even more extreme female. So what does this mean? Well, all the major jobs uh, the U.S. government's projecting in terms of the future jobs, all the, the top ten, all but uh, two of them are already dominated by females. And when you look at the number of females in major categories, like the number of associates in law firms, you know, it's already the minor majority is female. And if you look at um, managerial positions. They just go across the board, just about every major profession. Um, in the last year or two, it has switched over to the majority female. And so if you look at college graduation rates and you look out the next 10, 20 years, we really are going to be headed much more to a female-dominated society. And think about the gender shifts that's happening. You hear more and more about guys staying home and raising, raising the kids, right? They've been cover of Time magazine and, and others have profiled this. So it means big implications for our society, uh, some incredibly positive and some probably neutral and, and maybe a few negative. So I think talking about that will be, will be interesting. And I, I will do one more. The, um, the ubiquitous nature of technology. We all have smartphones now. We all have cell phones that take pictures and that can communicate. We haven't seen anything yet. It's amazing if you think about the, the pace of technology it is reaching that inflection point. Like when we st first started to fly airplanes, we were at one of those <clears throat> two-wing aircrafts, and then all of a sudden we got to jets, <clears throat> and the next thing you know, we were taking off and going to the moon and walking on the moon. Well, we're sort of at that point where we're flying in jets now. And so in the future, not only are our cars going to talk to each other, but our refrigerator is going to be talking to our cars and our phones, and even our bodies are going to have little tiny chips floating around in them taking our uh, blood pressure and our cholesterol levels every second and perhaps even calling us to tell us we're in line to have a heart attack in a few minutes. We've got to get to an emergency room. It's going to be simply amazing. And there's going to be big data everywhere that is going to be connecting all of this technology. And so understanding the implications of that, how do we use big data? How are we uh, using that to the betterment of mankind and, and uh, keeping us all healthy? and solving a lot of the big problems that we need to solve, like poverty and, you know, and to, so forth. To your point, uh, we no noticed it earlier, look at what public square number nine was, social networking online, the MySpace phenomenon. Yeah. It's coming back. And what That's if the chip misdials and, and reaches the NSA and tells them you're right. going to have a heart attack? Right. So <laughs> the NSA <laughs> is just the tip of the iceberg. So great. So, so we've got a huge kind of swath, and, and a lot of these are really big kind of conceptual topics, right? So the role of government, politics 101, big demographic changes, sort of what's the regional transportation footprint look like? Um, education, both sort of its value and how we sort of reinvent that value, but also how we teach, right? Do we use technology to teach or not? Um, are the investments we make in our public schools, um, you know, over the top or are they appropriate? What are, what are some of the other topics that are important to you guys? So you're all here because you've got ideas and thoughts, and I'm just going to, I guess, Tom will do the bounce back and forth sure. across the room and yep. start here with Bob. Hi. Okay. 
Bob Lynch. I live in Richmond. Um, great minds obviously think alike because a lot of the things I would have suggested have been suggested and more clearly than I would have. But there are a couple things I would, I would like to see brought up more. And I will say this, that as we are using the words looking forward or, or going forward, sometimes it helps to find your way when you're lost in the woods if you know where you've been. So, of course, I think we, we need to study our history and bear that in mind along with the changing environment of today. Um, there's two particular issues I just want to mention very, very briefly. One would be, as he brought up public transportation, if we study that we had light rail at one time, the trolley systems connected cities such as Hopewell to Petersburg. Um, we need to, I would, I would like to think some studies should be made, if they're not already, on bringing back the trolley system, which was powered by the James and was pretty much a green system before they used the phrase. And we also can study and, and know that uh, our farmers were able to raise hemp in the past, such as uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. And we should examine whether industrial hemp and marijuana should be grown again in Virginia and legalized and the effect it's had upon us socially as a, uh, the war on drugs. I think that needs to be studied whether we can move forward um, and um, end that prohibition. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Somebody over here on this side of the room. This is a quiet group. I'll throw the mic out and somebody will catch it. Hello, Marilyn. Marilyn Lipsitz Flax. I live in Richmond my whole life. Um, one of the things that you mentioned that I w I'm very interested in because I am one is something about boomers. I think all these old people will come out of the woodworks and come down here for that. Another is transportation to the counties. That is a huge, huge problem. Um, and tied into that is about the minimum wage. You know, are the jobs going back to this morning in Chaco Bottom going to be minimum wage jobs or are they going to be a livable wage? So I think that's a biggie. Um, another one, my husband's a lawyer, so I was thinking about a program about legal services for the middle class, for people who aren't super rich, who don't qualify for legal aid, how can you fix it so that they get legal services and the lawyer doesn't starve? So I thought those were, oh, and one more, um, medical breakthroughs. I think about heart health or about helping people with cancers. I think medical breakthroughs would be a really interesting topic. Tom, you want to sure. pass the mic real quick? Yeah, right, and pass the mic. Uh, it's a bit of a juggling act here. George Vogel, and I live near Crosby. I'm in Brander Mill, and we have one other thing in common that I'm very proud of. In 2006, I was the Richmond Times-Dispatch Correspondent of the Year. <laughs> so, and that was quite an honor, and I had hoped that uh, during that day with all the 300 and some correspondents of the day in the room, at the end of the lunch, we could have had breakout sessions because there'd be an awful lot of interesting people we could argue with. But uh, the reason I'm here today, and it surprises me, because I thought it was the big gorilla in the room that nobody would talk about, and you talked about medical breakthroughs, and he talked about hemp and cannabis. Cannabis, put it on up there. I'm an old guy. I'm 69 years old. I'm before the boomers, okay? And, you know, I went through the 60s, and I never smoked this stuff. But let me tell you something. There are some major breakthroughs with cannabis, okay? We're going to call I mean, time out. Just, we'll go back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of Virginia has dropped by to say hello on the public square. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> governor, thank you. I know you got a busy schedule. We're in the process of debriefing after a whole day of public, of a, a public civil conversation. And uh, here's, here, here's your offer. If you, had to, if you had to pick any topic in Virginia for us to talk about, what comes to mind? Uh, closing the coverage gap. Okay, closing, okay. Getting the Medicaid expansion money back here to Virginia. Now, that's, an, that's, that's something you haven't been talking about much, have you? I talk about a lot. Um, SOL reform. Okay. Ethics reform. Most importantly, growing, diversifying the economy. How to create new jobs. Good. If you came back and were the guest star of a public square, what would be the perfect conversation for you? Well, for me, it's how taking care of the folks here in the Commonwealth of Virginia to make sure they're getting a quality education that we're competing in the 21st century would right. be the biggest. It's the challenge I face every day as I compete 
uh, you know, against 49 other states and 200 nations around the globe. How do we compete? How do we bring jobs here? We do it by keeping Virginia open and welcoming. That's why I signed executive order number one, no discrimination in the state workforce based on sexual orientation. Um, we got to make ourselves open and welcome. We've got to be bringing innovators in. That's a huge challenge. I'm sure we all just saw that there was a Department of Defense uh, notice the other day that they're talking about deactivating the George Washington aircraft carrier. That will cost us tens of thousands of jobs in Virginia. So how do you prepare for these challenges with Department of Defense cuts and grow and diversify the economy so that our kids stay here? Right. You know, we have, before you came, we introduced, this is a lineup of our correspondents of the day, and they're also helping us from various perspectives. I, this gentleman also wants you to sign his cast before you leave. I don't know if you do. I, know. I don't know if you do special requests, but anyway. Uh, we'll and and you also had a campaign volunteer here as well. Uh, so you've uh, oh <laughs> extra pair of, pair of legs for but you. Uh. I don't know if you remember, uh, this is Cosby High School. We did a forum um, on the first Barack Obama election when he was running against John McCain. And you stood in for the Democrat, and you debated the Republican who stood in was George Allen. Right. And uh, that was one of our spirited debate. It was at, it was at, since we have a Cosby theme... You, okay. You also did. You also did something that scared the heck out of the audience. If you remember, you were the one who walked to the audience and you went and just put your foot over, and everybody went, "Oh." Oh, in the edge of the stage. Yeah, and you explained it as a technique to get people's attention. That's why we're. That's why we're not on the stage today. <laughs> but anyway, we, I just recall that we really appreciate that, yeah. and here you are, years later, eight years later on it. Anything you might want to add, or a message you might want to add from? Let me, let me ask you this: the public square is an experiment in civil discourse. Before you came here, we talked about how whenever we put up a topic about government, we're seeing fewer and fewer people show up. There is a picture of Donna McEachin and Jimmy Massey. They helped us when our, when our public square was on disclosure. And they said it wasn't worth people's time, and so the audience is dwindling away. They said that was scary, and they were worried about that. What can we do to improve the civil discourse in Virginia so if there are tough issues, People are attracted to go there to have that conversation so the talkers and listeners at least are united in the fact that they had a chance to talk about an issue. What, 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 we talk about a Virginia way in many aspects. What do you see missing and what, what, how can we foster that? Well, I think the biggest problem, I think people view government as dysfunctional. They're tired of the partisan bickering. They're tired of not seeing anything getting done. And I lay most of that at the feet. I mean, that's why I've always supported nonpartisan redistricting. I think the gerrymandering and the partisan redistricting that has gone on in this country. John's writing, actually, John's writing as a topic up there, too. Yeah, I just think it's really destroyed democracy as we know it. I mean, as we all know, uh, elected officials draw lines. They're guaranteed to win in re-election. If you look at the United States Congress, 80% don't even have races. And I, first of all, I think race is important. I think challenges is good. Hello, Zarina, how are you? I think challenges are great. Uh, it keeps you sharp in business, but if you don't have competition, guess what? You're not as sharp as you could be. So what happens is 80% don't even have a race, and then of those 20% that do, they really get challenged. The only way they can lose is in their own primary, so it has pushed people to the right, and it's pushed people way to the left. The middle's gone, and so nothing's getting done. You look at Washington today, and absolutely nothing is happening. They don't even talk to each other. And so I don't blame people for saying, well, you know what, politics doesn't matter because nothing gets done. I've tried to change that. As I said, I will operate in a bipartisan way. Many members of my cabinet, as you know, are Republicans. It's, it didn't matter to me. Uh, I'm reaching out. Uh, as I said, I would call every Republican in the General Assembly after I was elected. I did that. It took me two weeks. Every day I have a, almost every day I have a breakfast at the mansion. I invite the House Republican leadership, the Senate. I do a reception every, need, every evening, bringing folks together. Let's talk. To, there is common ground. But it, people got to give on both sides. Compromise is not a bad word. You have to do it. Uh, I don't get everything I want in life, nor do you, nor does anybody. But this idea that I won't sit and let's, let's take closing the, the coverage gap. This is billions of dollars of our money that's going to the federal government. Why wouldn't we bring that back? I have to compete against 26 states today who are accepting the money. They're going to have lower health care costs, lower premiums, because Virginia taxpayers are paying for their work. It makes no sense. Put the politics aside. This isn't about Obamacare. And it. That's over. How do we work together to find common ground to move Virginia forward? From your experience, what are the ingredients? As somebody who's now at the head of Virginia government, what are the ingredients of a civil discourse that improves 
that improves the likelihood of people coming to a common ground? I think first and foremost what I've tried to do, one, is build relationships. Okay. I mean, in order to get together, that's why I'm doing all I'm doing. I'm out every day. I'm out meeting with folks. You've got to build a personal relationship. I came from the business sector, so I hadn't been in, in government, so I've got to build a relationship with the folks. But then it's a willingness to say, let's sit in a room and let's figure this out. I'm, I don't go to any negotiation and say, I'm not open to any idea. You've got a good idea, let's figure out if we can do it together. There is too much of this, we're not going to do this under any circumstances. Well, that's not a way to begin a negotiations. Right. You're not going to be successful doing that. I will sit down and look at any, any options we have. At the end of the day, everybody has to give a little. Compromise to get where we need to be. Okay, great. Anybody have any quick questions for the governor? How much time do you have? I know you're busy. T got time for two questions. Thanks. And, okay. Hi, and I'm Renee Saray, and we met at Cosby High School when you so graciously came and, and agreed to do the speech, and that was wonderful. Um, I'd like to put a plug in, I know that you don't agree with this, for letting counties open schools before Labor Day. If I could have that week back in August and we could have started earlier that we've lost to snow, these kids would have a little bit more government knowledge before they take that advanced placement exam. And I really feel like I'm at a disadvantage with the teachers in other states because they get to start so much earlier and their kids are that much more prepared for this advanced placement exams. And I understand the other side, but I'd, I'd love to get you to, to think about that and, and to think about supporting that. And uh, the General Assembly obviously has to support it as well. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that in a more expanded way. Sure. And this, you know, this obviously came up in the campaign a lot. Uh, first of all, I'm open to anything. I mean, people ask me about charter school. I'm open to looking at anything. Whatever's going to get us the best uh, educated workforce, I am open to it. The one thing opening prior to Labor Day has a severe economic impact on the Commonwealth. It's about a 363, somewhere around that million dollar price tag of moving ahead. It affects all of our tourist assets. So obviously, as governor, I've got to look at that as an important issue. Um, I said the other day, you know, I'm not a fan of these where we are, we're grading schools, we give schools letter grades. I'm really against that. I mean, the second you give a school an F, the second you do that, you have stigmatized the children, the teachers, the community. I mean, our public schools, a lot of it comes from real estate taxes. Well, are you going to, anyone going to move into a community that has a school that's an F? Of course not. And the p people that are in the area are going to move out. And for many folks, they're upside down on their mortgage, so... Folks who most might need help are going to be stuck. Now, I've said I'd be open to uh, those schools that are historically have issues. If they want to start early or go year round, I'd be open to that. I'm open to looking at any option that would make it uh, the best educated workforce. I always say life is balances. It's compromise. I do balance that against. But if it's a troubled school and you show me that by going year round or longer hours, then I'd be all for it. I mean, uh, I always talk about, I visited um, the Achieval, Achievable Dream. I don't know, has anyone been to the Achievable Dream? It is one of the greatest assets we have in Virginia. It is a public school. Now, uh, about $2.5 million is raised on top of what the school costs they get from public sources, but private sector comes in and helps. It is unbelievable. Every child comes from a disadvantaged background. Very tough circumstances for many of the kids. These children now, they, they have, they, it's an hour longer. The teachers line up to do it. The teachers get paid more. They go every other Saturday. But it's a whole thing of what they do. Over 25 years, like 90% or something have gone on to college. It's spectacular. There are best practices. So I think we ought to look at all those best practices first. I'm for a longer, another hour longer school day. Every other Saturday, we ought, let's look at it. I'm open to it. I'm always open to it. So he, here's the final question to the guy who wants you to sign his cast. Depending on his question, you can decide whether you want to sign his cast. I'm putting you on the spot. Right, He's headed to Tech, by the way. Um, Thank you. Congrats. I remember during. It's on. I remember during your de um, debate at it was actually at Virginia Tech. You yep. mentioned a lot about your SOL reform and opening to more comprehension-based things and looking at essay more towards the SOLs. And I definitely encourage you to definitely support that idea because I've been taking AP exams since I was a sophomore year and. You know, the difference between AP style classes and regular ones, it's a huge difference. And I don't think if it wasn't for those AP classes, that's what's really given me the ability to really engage my critical thinking skills. So and I think that would definitely help out most students who do not get the privilege to take those AP classes. Well, and this is something I talked about a lot on the campaign show. We, there are too many tests. There's like 33 between the grades of 3 and 11. And you're not even talking about the pre-tests to get you ready to take the tests. 
So all we're doing is taking tests. And at the end of the day, our children are learning how to memorize, and our teachers are teaching the tests. And there wasn't a day that I didn't have a teacher after I gave my speech who came up to me and said, you know, you're right. I love teaching. I quit teaching because I was teaching to a test. Um, as I always say, uh, this high-stakes, multiple-choice test, I'd rather have earlier in the year also. First of all, if there's a problem with a, a student, why do we give it at the end of the year? The teacher's done with the student. I'd rather know in the beginning of the year of, of things we needed to work on. You know, an essay, then you at least like talk about Wallops Island and how that could be the new spaceport there could be a huge economic driver for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Someone writes an essay about that, I know there's some critical cognitive thinking going on. So we'll get it done. Um, Tag Greeson and uh, Rob Caprica in the House of Delegates are working with Ann Holton, my Secretary of Education. We're going to get a bill out. We're going to get a SOL reform. We're going to get ethics reform. It's very important. I did sign my executive order, as I say, a $100 limit for myself and uh, my administration and my family. Uh, I just learned the consequences that this weekend I was in an event and someone gave me a gift and, of course, for my wife. And, and um, I said, is it under $100? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Great. So we took it back and my wife opened it up and it was a Neiman Marcus bag. So immediately my antenna went up. I said, oh, boy. So I had my wife go to Neiman Marcus. It was a scarf. Huh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't. And uh, so I had her get a check. That was $420.19. So... Today I wrote a check for $320.19. I ended up buying a scarf that I did not want. My <laughs> wife didn't want it, but it is what it is. These are the consequences that you do. But listen, it's the right thing to do. We've got to get it. <clears throat> so many issues have gone on. Workforce development is something I'm really into. But I spend most of my day calling around the globe on economic development, growing, diversifying the economy. Um, and what you talk about on SOL reform is important. We want to make sure that when I'm convinced a CEO to move their businesses to Virginia, that we're going to have a workforce 10, 20, 30 years, and that's a great educated workforce. And as long as I'm on an education, I'm a huge advocate of pre-K, early childhood development. If 80% of the brain is developed between birth and three, let's not be picking winners and losers at birth. Let's not be dependent upon one zip code or parent's financial condition. And this can't be a sole state responsibility, but, you know, community, faith-based groups, working with private sector. We can do this. If we all come together, common purpose, that's why it's great this public square. Let's come up with some new creative ideas and, and we'll get where we need to be. So. Governor, thanks very much for all stopping great. by on a Thank busy you. Schedule. Didn't mean to interrupt all your... We got a magic marker. You got a yeah. magic marker? All right. I know you got a busy schedule. So, Governor, if we, uh, if we use all the ideas generated today, the 101st public square, if we go in order, will be on Virginia's outer space economy. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, here we go. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Special orders do not upset the governor. How about that? What happened? Still will happen. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Governor. Really appreciate that. Thanks for stopping by. Staff, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. The governor of Virginia. Thank you very much. Okay. And coming in the back door, we <laughs> have. Uh, so, Tom, where do you where do you want to take this? We've got uh, we have forty seven uh, topics generated, pretty wide variety. Look, look, he can't get his eyes off the. Uh, I know, the he's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a couple. We, we got a couple more. We were. Uh, we, I'm we sorry, you're right. Past, we never you're got past right. cannabis. I believe I is where we stopped. Right. Remember sorry. way back when, before I, I gave you're, the you're, mic you're, to the man. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about cannabis, and she talked about Up here. mental health and the benefits of this. We have a, a delegate in the General Assembly in Virginia right now. It's legal to smoke cannabis for glaucoma and cancer. He made a bill to eliminate that opportunity for people with glaucoma and cancer. To, and you know what he said? He goes, if we pass that and keep this on the books, the next thing we're going to have in Virginia is casinos. And I'm going, is this guy smoking dope or what? You know, and, and so who are you I'm talking, talking about? about? And who, one who last you, thing. Who are you talking about? I don't remember the delegates. Oh, status, okay. All but right. it's House Bill 584. Okay. 584 to eliminate cancer patients and people with glaucoma from gotcha. getting 
cannabis legally, gotcha. okay? Then we're talking about Rush Limbaugh didn't get addicted to cannabis. He got addicted from an industry that he sells Oxycontin every day to people. Okay. There's more damage there. No person in Virginia or no person in the United States has been classified dead because of marijuana. Five people have died from Red Bull in this country, and yet what do we do? One last thing on government. I was governmental affairs director for the National Association of Realtors for five years. I ran the largest political action committee in the country. I dealt with elected officials. I got so disgusted I walked away. What we need to do in this country to solve our governmental problems is term limits. Not the two year reelect them every year because everybody else reelects their guy. It's the guy in California that's the bad politician. Shame on them. It's right here. We elect the same people. We don't pick we don't pick our representatives. The representatives pick us who vote for them. Right. They draw the lines. And so term limits is what we need to do to change the problem that we have in government. Thank you. Okay, thank you. okay I'm going to pass the mic. I'm going to give you a mic, Jim. And you've been real kind also, so let, let him go uh, first. John's comments over here uh, concern me about the state of the families, and particularly kids, uh, and given both the, uh, in terms of the roles of males and females, but the oncoming generations getting uh, educated and getting the love and uh, affection and guidance of a mother and father. Uh, secondly, I'm concerned about volunteering for those boomers and, uh, and people like uh, Ruby Turner. And I'm hoping that they'll come on strong and that they'll either volunteer to uh, mentor or to work the score or feed, feed mark or continue to work and, and generate income for the economy. And, uh, and so pe serve people like Ruby Turner and oh, yeah. uh, come Next out with generation. hope to come up with a book that might have something to do with it. Okay, story. well, we look forward. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yes, sir. Okay, my name's uh, Chuck Davis, otherwise known as the proud parent of Megan Davis right okay, there. Okay, all right, Dad. Um, but I've been a school teacher for, uh, I'm in my 31st year at Colonial Heights Middle School. And so my area of expertise is technology education, and I would like to see um, what can be done in our area to promote what we call STEM education, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And for all these new jobs they talk about coming in, these are the areas um, that we really need to focus on. Um, and that is my vocation. My avocation is I'm uh, very involved in um, the environment and fly fishing, particularly. And I would like to um, see more concern around this area for um, the proposals for fracking in George Washington National Forest, which will end up affecting our, the James River, the tailwaters of the James River, and ultimately our drinking supply. I, I will say um, my compliment, my counter to the government, the squares we've had on energy are some of the best draws. Um, and it's also, um, the squares where people stay in a room afterwards, actually to continue the conversation with their opponents. We've had a couple of them. They've been one of the more stimulating ones. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, and one more okay. uh, particular interest um, I have is there's um, a concern now that with the King's Grant um, movement to privatize um, navigable water, and ultimately, if some of these lawsuits that have gone through is not supported by um, our government, that people can start blocking off parts of the James River and won't let people float by, won't let people fish. And um, that's something I haven't heard really discussed in this area. Okay, good. James River is another one that draws a big crowd as well. A lot of concern and interest in that. John, how are we doing? We're, uh, you're good till about uh, 2023, Tom. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. I'm Peter Shinholzer. Uh, oh, I've noticed John Shinholzer's brother. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you ever wanted to keep him quiet, I'll give you an idea. Have one of these town halls on a disease of addiction. You know, we, we talked about the mental illness. Uh, you talked about the drugs and, and being an expert there. Uh, invite these gentlemen back and my brother back and, and have them on the disease of addiction. You know, uh, as the lady was talking about earlier, you know, if we're losing 10 people a day just to heroin overdoses or, or opiate overdoses, 
put all the other drugs in there. Um, you know, I'm sure there's other ways we could get cannabis into our systems other than smoking it uh, that would work just as effective as anything else instead of making it available out there to the students here. I was a student one time, but I was never invited to this because I was addicted. Uh, congratulations, and congratulations to the father back there. It's, you know, it's a wonderful thing. My parents did not raise me to be an addict, okay? I was born that way. Uh, I never thought I was going to stand up in front of a group and tell you this. Uh, I have a handful of my people back here that came with me. Uh, I think to have one of these things on the disease of addiction itself would be a wonderful thing. Okay. Thanks. Good point. Thank you. So uh, so two thoughts I'm going to sort of pull out, and then, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you to tie a bow around this. So I'm going to pull on a couple of threads that were thrown out in the room. And one is, um, John, you talked a lot about this, but the changing demographics. And one thing that I've spent a lot of time on, I work with a lot of nonprofits in the, in the region, and we talk a lot about not just the changing uh, demographics in terms of age or gender, but the changing demographics in terms of the ethnicity of our region, um, that we've historically been a region that has been defined by black and white or black and African American communities and sort of how they have or haven't interacted or assimilated well over the years. But we've got some new uh, groups that are moving into the region and they're significant. Um, significant in the terms of by 2025 or 2030, upwards of 20% of this region will be first or second generation Asian or Latin American uh, or Hispanic. So not white or black, but we are going to be a very blended region, and it's going to be a very different set of conversations that I think um, we might want to have as a region about who are we and what's our identity going forward, and tying it back to what lessons can we draw. I think somebody talked earlier about what are the lessons we can draw from our past. So what has our past taught us that can help us have a better future with a more diverse community in the region? Uh, the second piece is around science, and so we heard about sort of Wallops Island, and we heard about technology, and... Um, uh, that was in STEM education. What, what does it mean for this region, or what could it mean for this region, to be more of a science-based region? That our workforce, not just in biotech, but in engineering, uh, in logistics, and math, and science, what is, what is the opportunity in the region to sort of shift the base of our economy in a very different way, in a way that's going to be more competitive with those 200 other countries that the governor mentioned, not just the other 49 states? So that's another piece that I think would be an interesting conversation to have, sort of how could we make that shift regionally. So those are the two uh, kind of big ideas I pulled out of Yeah, uh, what so we have up here. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll bring this to the public square planning team, we'll lock and load for next. There's also some conversation about trying to reinvent it, um, trying to do a little bit more. The only frustration I hear at the public square is what does it lead to? Well, um, there are some topics, what it led to is that people could stay in the room and talk to each other at least for 90 minutes. And that's not something to back off of, but we're always trying to make the impact. We don't want to get in the way of others who are working on it. We do want to call attention to potential solutions. So that might be where we um, operate. We've had, a, we've had a whole bunch of topics over the 50. We tend to play off the news. Um, and so the, for, for that, we really don't know what the other topics will be. We don't know what news will happen. Some are pr predictable. Um, the mental health, given its history, you know, there might be another version of that within the 50. But there are probably going to be topics that we don't have on that list, although it's a darn good list, and thank you for your suggestions. Um, but it's something we'll keep at. So uh, this has been an, uh, an interesting journey. Um, we're going to continue it because uh, we get a heck of a lot out of it, and I hope you do too. Come back anytime. I do see my friend Tom Gallagher over there who probably has one of the better public square stories, so I'm going to end it on him because uh, he came to a public square yeah, second one, and I'm, I'm going to ask him whether he's still married. <coughs> Until I get home. Oh. Well, my name is Tom Gallagher. I, uh, we had, I think the second one was on charities, uh, charitable contributions, and I'm, I'm involved in that. Uh, I work for Better Business Bureau. <coughs> so I was, uh, Tom asked me to come. I think he had a panel, and it was on December 5th. Well, I was conflicted ethically, which is something we can talk about. Um, and it was supposed to... It, I was supposed to be home. It was my wife's birthday, and I was supposed to be here. I had all of these things going on, <laughs> and just because Jesus loved me, it snowed that night, and the public square got, got canceled until the next night. So you're and the that, guy who did that. that I yeah. did it. Okay. I did it. I can do that on demand, and it was a good thing. So it was a great thing. And on, on the ethical piece, um, <clears throat> I was thinking about a public square kind of a deal uh, one of my kids did, David did, yeah. when he was at VCU. Uh, in the business school there and uh, put, pulled together an ethical discussion involving uh, Hayes Watkins, 
uh, um, oh golly, Bob, Bob Freeman and John Shreves, who were around town and happening people, and they just talked about ethical dilemma in business. Well, we all have ethical dilemma. We are all faced with those things every day, not just in business, but in school, uh, in church, in, uh, in our communities, on our work of board of directors. And um, I just, I think that is at the, at the root of every success or every failure we can possibly experience as, as a region. Uh, is how we view things ethically and uh, put ourselves into it and insert ourselves into it. Right. Thank you, Tom. I thought about you this morning when I saw that the snow was in the forecast. Well, we're getting time ready to celebrate. Uh, um, please join us in the lobby. We have some special public square cupcakes. Just as you saw in the video, there is cake. Um, appreciate you showing up. It's been a long day. We started about 10 to, uh, 10.20. We had five topics stacked up. We went through them one by one, the ballpark, pro-con. Went through the foodie town and had actually had some, it was actually somebody rushed the table before we could even get started. So we had to calm everybody down and we talk about why is Richmond all of a sudden a great foodie town. Then we went after another controversial topic on same-sex marriage. A lot of people debating on the wording on that. Uh, the audience behaved marvelously in making their points. Actually, I saw opponents in the hallway talking to each other. That's a testament to the public square. Then we dealt with how can Virginia improve the mental health coverage. Um, provocative conversation. That, that's a conversation we're going to keep watching. And finally, put the square up on the radar to kind of figure out what needs to go. And so we're going to go after these topics later on in life. So it's time to celebrate. So join us in the lobby. Enjoy and have a public square cupcake. Really want to thank you for spending time with us. Those of you who uh, have been here for all, God bless you. We'll see you around. Thank you. Appreciate it.